Roberts, and you're listening to Authentic Leadership, a series of conversations, insights, and inspirations with leaders who are real, raw, and authentic. Today, I bring you a fascinating and insightful conversation with Michael Henderson, corporate anthropologist. We veered off the set questions almost immediately and ended up with a conversation that explores organizational culture from, from many and varied perspectives. At times, I sounded more like a student than a podcast host, because every question Michael answered brought up yet another question and took us in another direction. Enjoy. I saw Michael speak at a learning and development and HR symposium recently where I was running a workshop. And from the moment he opened his mouth, my pedant couldn't move fast enough as I was furiously taking notes. I looked around and everyone else was doing exactly the same. It was like these light bulbs of insight were, were popping everywhere. So, so what was Michael speaking on? Well, the topic was culture. Michael Henderson is a corporate anthropologist, so in simple terms, a culture expert. He has overseen or supported over 300 company culture transformations in countries around the globe and in many different sectors. And I'm thrilled today to welcome him as my guest in conversation for Leading with Culture. Michael, a very, very warm welcome to Authentic Leadership. Thank you so much, Claire. Delighted to be here. Great. So, Going back to it was probably a couple of months ago now when I heard your keynote, there's something that, that piqued my curiosity was when you said that culture as a strategic asset is the number one people and culture HR priority. So what then got me curious was really wanting to know, in your experience, if that is the case, then what percentage of organizations are, are, are actively consciously working on their culture as that strategic asset? And if not, why not? Yeah, such a, that's such a great question, Claire. Um, it's, it's just incredible that the stats, and I'll tell you where they came from in a moment, the stats mm-hmm. are that only 8% of organisations are aligning or have aligned their culture as a strategic asset. So that means a lot of money on the table. I know. It's incredible. Um, So it kind of means that 92% of organizations have either done some work on culture but not uh, understood how it connects to strategy and therefore aligned as a strategic asset, or they haven't done work on strategy and realized that they needed to factor in culture as a contributing factor. And that research uh, came out of a client that I was invited to work with in Europe some years ago mm-hmm. who were looking at undertaking a substantial culture transformation globally. I can't mention who they are because I've got a non-disclosure with them, but they're, yeah. a, they're operating in every continent. They've got 86,000 employees worldwide, so reasonably large organization. And... What they what they did was they they said, look, just before we sort of launch into this culture transformation journey, we just want to stop and pause and do some research on how effective are culture transformations before we kind of commit all this time and effort and energy mm. and money. And so they hired a couple of uh, very well-known uh, research centers. And again, I can't mention who they are, but if I did, you'd know, you would have heard of them. Yeah. And came back with the research that I just quoted, sort of saying that only 8% kind of make the link between culture and strategy so that culture becomes an asset to the strategy, which, of course, begs the question, why? Why, why are so many organisations getting it wrong? And there's several reasons for that. I'd say in my experience, the number one reason is that organisations don't understand what culture is and what it does. And I, I, I know how kind of um, ridiculous that might sound because every organization has a culture. But what they realized once we sort of dug into it, what we realized was that the vast majority of the organizations spoke about culture but didn't know about culture. Mm. And so that becomes a crucial um, foundational understanding. Uh, I, I believe organizations really, really, really need to get to grips with this. What is culture? Where does it come from? How does it form? And what's it actually doing on a daily basis? Because if you don't understand that, as you said earlier, you're kind of leaving a lot on the table that you you could otherwise be accessing as an organisation. And then that also begs the question, if 
we're talking about the organization so that's presumably you know the, the 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 leadership of the organization if they don't understand how on earth do the people who they're attracting into the organization understand yeah absolutely right so there's um there seems to be kind of um almost the higher you go up in the organization the more the relevance of culture as a strategic asset seems to slip by or gets ignored or is never even just factored in and never even considered. Whereas I find most staff, um, so just employees kind of working within the business, if you actually get into a conversation with them about that, they absolutely realise there's a connection. But often um, the gap they have is that they haven't had strategy explained to them in a way that they can understand, relate to and connect to. So even from their side... They've kind of got a cultural experience they're having working in the business but can't see how to connect it to the strategy because strategy hasn't been explained clearly. Oh, you know, that's that's such that's such an important point. And sorry, I know you said you said point one and and, and we'll come back to to the rest of the points in a minute. But that's something in 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 my own experience. I I experienced so much as a when I was sort of going into my management career and in leadership that when I was taking on a new team or a new area or a new department, they they didn't fully understand, certainly they didn't understand how their roles connected to the big picture of the organisation. And even though they knew about culture in terms of um, describing, I don't know, what was, you know, what frustrated them about the organisation and what have you, there seemed to be an assumption that for want of a better word, the lower down you got in the organization, they didn't need to know about strategy. And that always baffled me. Mm. Yeah, I found the same thing, that um, there was either a perception, as you say, where people didn't need to know. Or the other the other thing I've noticed as well is that leaders feel like they've already explained what culture is because they announced it at the <laughs> at the annual gathering last November. I spoke on it for forty minutes. Why haven't people understood and implemented? So yeah, yeah I just I just find that you know if you look at the amount of work and energy and time that goes into defining strategy, there just seems to be a massive gap in the communication of that into the business. Yeah. And then also not just communicating to the business, but but listening to the organization's response to what's being asked of them strategically. Yeah. You know, kind of you up for that? Does that inspire you? Do you feel capable of that? Um, you know, that's sort of what's your reaction to it? So in actual fact, uh, I know we sort of, we, we said we've sort of come back to the other points, but that is the second kind of major point is I find that um, strategy both isn't understood as much as you might expect in organisations and it's certainly not communicated as effectively as it should be most of the time as well, which is another contributing factor why it makes it hard to align culture as a strategic asset if the strategy Mm. isn't clear in the first place. And then secondly, if the strategy hasn't been communicated effectively into the business, it makes it really, really difficult to align culture to it effectively. So what... What what stops this being high on the agenda? What what why is there an absence of that awareness? Do you think? And I know it's not everybody's. We're not generalising, but I, I'm just fascinated as to what why it's not top of the of the priorities. Yeah. Um, well, the the first. Uh, reason it's kind of very pragmatic actually is there's not a lot of people at senior leadership levels in organizations that have ever had any useful access to education on culture Ah. and so most of them have gone down a you know an MBA or a degree in marketing or have got an accounting background, or have done you know business business strategy or uh, business management. Uh, study Mm -hmm. and also not not even if it's just formal study but even a lot of the practical experience they've had in building their careers often hasn't centered on or understood or been drawn from a culture perspective Mm. so um, it's actually quite a, a simple explanation is that most leaders have not had exposure to understanding what culture is, what it does, how it forms and how it functions. And therefore, it's very easy for them to overlook it because they don't have it on their radar per se. 
So, so that must be really interesting when you go into an organisation and and you're doing your research. That when you ask the question, "What is culture?" What sort of responses do you get? Yeah, um, mostly simplistic responses. Um, so, I'll give you a couple of examples. Mm. So people will often use almost a throwaway line like, uh, you know, say, so, you know, how do you define or kind of understand culture here in this business? And they go, oh, culture's the way we do things around here, which is that cliche statement, which I completely get. Again, if you haven't been exposed to any understanding or education around culture, that's a nice, convenient and probably sounds realistic answer. Yeah. The reality is, if you kind of look at it from an anthropology point of view, it is describing process and systems more than it's describing culture. So the way we do things around here is the systems that we implement, our methodology, our operating model. Mm -hmm. So culture is far better thought of and described in terms of being able to actually access it and understand it as why we do things this way around here. Ah. So by introducing the why element, you're now tapping into the meaning, the motivation, the belief system that we have about who we are, what we're trying to do, and therefore why we're doing it this way. Whereas if you stick with the original definition, which is the way we do things around here, you can look at the way it's being done and go, but that's not productive or that's Mm -hmm. ineffective or that's not good for the customer. So it doesn't... It doesn't put anything into context. So mm-hmm. cu- culture is always context- contextual. So that would be uh, one sort of response I've heard. The other response I hear quite regularly is kind of go, you know, how do you sort of describe culture around here? And I'm going to kind of exaggerate this a little bit just to make the point, so please forgive me. Yeah, sure. But, but it's almost they sort of point at the values or the mission statement or the purpose statement on the wall and go, oh, culture, yeah, it's that stuff. We did it last year. Yeah. And so they see it as a conversation uh, to come up with some soundbite or some statement that they then sort of park as a artifact um, around the halls and the walls of the manufacturing plants or the business head office reception, etc. Mm-hmm. And, and that's it. They sort of feel like, well, we've clarified our purpose, we've identified our values, we're good. And the reality, of course, is that culture is a living, breathing, um, social, performing network that's alive and breathing and active in your business. It's not the stuff hanging on the walls. So that, again, that lack of understanding means that people are leaving, as you said earlier, a lot of opportunity on the table simply because mm. they don't understand that it's, it's far more than the way we do things around here or, or a purpose and value statement. So, so, Michael, what are some of the things that that you've done with clients to to bring that to life? Sometimes I think about cultures like the the DNA or the personality of the organisation, and 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 the and it and it evolves. But if it's living, breathing, performing, then how how do you help people transition from that? you know, values, mission statement, stuff on the wall to, you know, and we're sort of going full circle in a way back to a strategic asset. But, but how, do you, how do you help bring it to life? Yeah, the, the first thing is, is um, to be aware of what are we talking about when we use this word culture? Mm. Because you, my experience says that you can't, change, improve, or enhance culture. You can't even align culture if you don't know what it is and you can't see it. So back to your original question, uh, the first thing we actually do with organizations is actually teach them how to think about and see culture right in front of their eyes. So that's probably the difference, Claire. If you imagine attending a meeting, a business meeting, Mm -hmm. and you were in there for, say, 45 minutes, and you were an active participant, and you came out of that meeting, and I said to you, hey, Claire, um, see, you were just in that meeting. Can you just describe the uh, meeting culture for me, please? There's a very good chance you wouldn't be able to answer that question effectively because you were caught up in the meeting. Yes. So you were sort of locked into following the conversation, deciding whether you agreed or disagreed, voicing your opinion, etc. 
Whereas if an anthropologist was sitting in the room and actually observed the meeting's culture, then there's a whole bunch of other dynamics that will have been observed or heard mm. that can provide you with the context as to where there's opportunities to improve that meeting in terms of efficiency or clarity or inclusion or involvement or creativity or innovation, etc. Okay, yeah. So it's just teaching business people um, how to have a lens on culture so they can actually see that it's real, not just some theoretical, uh, yeah. abs- abstract concept that sort of floats around in the ether in their business. So, okay, so now I want to, uh, uh, sorry, we've gone um, completely off the questions I was planning, <laughs> planning to ask, which I thought might happen. No problem. So, and 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 I, 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 I know you're very humble, but I, I want to ask you, I don't know if there's a right way to ask this, but as an anthropologist, so there are, there are many... Um, uh, organizations out there, uh, consultants, advisors that, that advise on culture transformation. But what is it about being an anthropologist that makes the difference in terms of how, how you help organizations with their culture? I think, I think it's because um, – Cultural anthropology or, or social anthropology, as it's sometimes called, is it's just a specialist social science that is focused on understanding how human beings curate a culture for themselves. Right. So it basically means that um, I and, and other anthropologists have been trained how to understand how this thing called culture occurs in the first place. And potentially that is just a level of inquiry that maybe is a little bit deeper, if I could use Mm -hmm. maybe that word, or a little bit more contextual than potentially, say, a business consultant that is just working on culture would take. So that makes sense. So what it means is that we are... um, we are more acutely attuned to seeing culture um, than a lot of people that haven't been trained that way. Mm. And um, maybe I can just take a back, backward step to explain how that occurs. Yeah, I'm really um, curious about that. Yeah, so that there's a branch of anthropology called cognitive anthropology, which is basically, and so it's really flourishing since we've got things like MRI scans and uh, we've got a lot more information now about how the brain processes information and how the brain, being that we're a human beings and therefore a social species, mm-hmm. how, does, how does the brain um, prioritize and organize socializing with others? So how does the brain determine who's safe to be around and who's not, who's likable or who's unlikable or who's friendly or who's unfriendly? Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of kind of more uh, information around that that cognitive anthropology has been able to sort of play with and understand about how cultures are forming. One of the things that's emerged out of cognitive anthropology was they suddenly started realizing that when it comes to culture in particular, that human beings don't think in words about culture they think in schematics Ah. so a schematic is a shape or a model or a um, symbol or an archetype of what we are thinking about so if i said to you for example um if you think of the most fundamental most simplistic schematic your brain could imagine for capturing visually a house, mm-hmm. what would you draw, for example, if you were to, if you were to represent what you can visualise and draw it on? A box, a triangle, a chimney, and four windows and a door. There you go. And I've just done the same. <laughs> I've just done the same while we've been talking. And here's the point, Claire. I I would imagine all your listeners, as we posed that question, did exactly the same thing. Yeah. So what happens is we we now know that. Um, Culture is built on schematics and schematics that are held in common, that are meaningful, enable organizations to be able to create cultures with a far more reliable foundation than just talk or bullet points in slide decks. (laughs) So schematics become really, really important. And then building on that, what becomes really, really interesting is that our 
ability to perceive, one of the things we've identified in anthropology is what people can perceive within a culture. In other words, what they can see in their environment and what their blind spots are or what they ignore is determined by the schematics they have available to process the information that their senses are taking into the environment around them. And so this is all unconscious. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So what's fascinating is that your perception is influenced, if you like, by your schematic vocabulary. So the broader your vocabulary, the more you will notice in an environment. The more restricted your schematic vocabulary is, the less you will notice in the same environment as somebody that's got a broader uh, vocabulary than you have. Wow. So, so you help people broaden their schematic. Their, yeah, their cultural schematics. Exactly right. It's exactly what we do. So we basically help organizations broaden their cultural schematics so that they can then be in a better position to attend that meeting that we kind of alluded to earlier, yeah. sit in there for 40 minutes, come out, and I go, great, so you just participated in a 40-minute meeting. Um, what was your perception of the meeting culture? And now you can talk to me. Now you can describe what you saw and heard yeah. using the schematics that we've introduced you to to be looking for and listening for and looking through and listening through while you're participating in the culture. Wow. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm still processing that. <laughs> well, maybe I can give you another a, a kind of an analogy that gives you maybe something that's a little bit more accessible and familiar. It's almost like, and this is speaking into your world, because um, you're um, heavily involved in teaching business people in storytelling, right? Mm. So I know you've got a wonderful um, schematic or model for showing people how to craft a story. Yeah. So if you imagine that, that you've got, and I'm, I'm, I don't mean to oversimplify what you do, Claire, but imagine you've got a seven-step process of how to capture, identify, um, fulfill, and explain a story to somebody. And maybe mm -hmm. the story's about uh, who, your who you are as a business, right? So it's like a, one of those elevator pitches, explain yeah. who you are in less than 60 seconds. So it's just like you do with storytelling. If you've got a schematic about here's the beginning, here's the middle, and here's the end of my story, and here's mm -hmm. who the hero is in the story, then suddenly it's really, really simple process to actually start to explain to other people the narrative of your business or mm. the story of your business or the mm. story of your product. So all we're doing culturally is replicating that process, is teaching you schematics to be able to think about, understand, and communicate culture more effectively. Get it. So on from that, a scenario, um, so, you, so you've, you've taken an organization through this process. Um, how, do you, how do you identify um, the, 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 <laughs> I'm wanting to say the wobbly parts. Yeah. Not, yep. not not necessarily toxic, but yep. do you know what I mean? Is 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 the the what the red flags potentially, or to be able to help them to see that it could be better, or all might not be well, or I'm not wording this very well, Michael. No, that's just... all right. I, I think I understand what you're asking. Um, so I'll attempt to respond, and you can tell me whether I actually am answering what you're asking. <laughs> Um, so one of the um, principles we work with is that there are no problems in the world. There are only perspectives. Ooh, I like that. And what that means is that what is a problem for you isn't necessarily a problem for others. What is a problem in your business isn't necessarily a problem for other people outside of your business. So let's say you've got a big problem in your business. I'm sure your competitors see it as, as an advantage to them. So they don't, they don't. Ah. And so even within organizations as well, you, and this is where you hear, you hear things like silo mentality, where um, one department or one business unit is not connecting effectively or communicating effectively or supporting effectively another business unit. And the people that are on the receiving end of that see that as a problem, understandably. And the way you address it is to look at both in both parties or both business units perspectives of how they see the relationship with each other because what you realize is that it's once you make people aware of the perspective they're holding mm 
they can therefore see a different way of interrelating or a better way of interrelating yeah. with that, without necessarily having to get into problem conversations. And the reason we kind of um, take that approach is that problems often end up with a blame conversation. Yeah. And you don't necessarily solve the actually underlying issue if you start treating it as a problem. And, and uh, I can give you, I could give you multiple examples where I've worked with clients where they thought they had identified the problem. And I think they even use the terminology, something like, here's our problem statement, mm-hmm. which is this is the problem we've identified. And in actual fact, the solution ends up being temporary. So it's almost like they've identified the problem as people have got headaches. The solution is therefore an aspirin. Yeah. Whereas the actual cause is not factored in as a problem. The cause might be dehydration. Right. So the yeah. reason you're getting headaches in the first place is you're not drinking anywhere near enough water and enough water regularly, and therefore you're getting headaches, and therefore you're reaching for an aspirin. So by understanding people's perspectives around, in this case, the situation of the headache, we can start to understand where are the headaches occurring, what are you doing that leads to a headache, when do you first notice you've got a headache, um, what have you been doing prior to the headache, etc. cetera. And, and out of that, you can start to identify contributing factors that may have nothing to do with the so-called problem that are actually, if you like, the cause of the situation in the first place. Wow. You know, you just got me thinking about when um, I I used to work for an internet service provider in in, in corporate development. And one of the things that we looked at was one of my jobs was to look at the KPIs of all the different business units and cross fertilize them. And then we realized we were in competition with ourselves. Um, And and one of the examples was like that sales were doing brilliantly. They would, you know, they were they were on fire. But then the provisioning couldn't provision what sales were selling. <laughs> right. Uh, because, the, you know, the, we were dependent on other partners and and they were very quality focused. And and I remember it's about how do we how do we sit down and have the conversation that's a, that it's a win, win, win and looking at it from how can these KPIs complement each other rather than cannibalize each other? Yeah. Might, yeah. Would that be an example? Yeah, absolutely. And I can maybe share a story with you. Um, This was years ago. I was working with a sales team in England. And the the reason I got brought in was they had identified there was a problem. as was exactly as you've described. Problem in their sales figures weren't anywhere near what they were hoping they would be. And had explored a number of different reasons for that, looking at incentive and training, etc., and then somebody sort of said, well, you know, is there something wrong with our sales culture? So they weren't sure, so they invited me to come and have a look. Long story short, what we identified was that the sales rep's perspective, and this one I'm saying it was identified as a sales problem, but it actually turned out to be the sales rep's perspective of the products they were selling. Ah. So the sales reps perceived that what the business charged for their products was too much for the product that they were providing compared to what was available elsewhere in the marketplace. So we're coming back to beliefs as well, aren't we? Which is what cultures form on. All cultures form out of belief systems. So once we identified that, we just said, okay, well, you're entitled to have that belief, but it's actually kind of inappropriate. And the sales reps are going, well, what do you mean by that? And I said, well, we're not really interested in what you believe about the product and whether you think it's priced too high or low. What we're really interested in is what the customer believes. So why don't you just, as an experiment, just park your belief on it's priced too high, go out and connect with customers to explore their world and what's going on, and let's hear their perspective. And what occurred was absolutely fascinating was we immediately had an increase in sales because suddenly some of the hesitancy or um, objections that the sales reps were putting Mm. in their own pathway suddenly disappeared and suddenly clients were buying off them in ways that otherwise the sales rep wouldn't have even turned up the meeting in some cases to even ask about. And it's not all good news as well. They also started to get feedback from customers saying, well, actually, we think your product's priced too high compared to what I can get elsewhere. So 
once we understood the customer's perspective, we yeah. were then able to unpack that a little bit as well and suddenly realized there was an opportunity in the sales process to look at how the customer was perceiving price. Because what they were doing was they were looking at the price they were being charged rather than the value they were going to get out of paying more. So that enabled us to represent a perspective on why we're charging more than your uh, your other providers are in the marketplace that, again, didn't address all the issues that customers had, but it gave us a significant increase. And between the combination of the two, the sales reps getting over their own objections, which is kind of ironic because they often get trained how to overcome customers' objections. <laughs> And we helped the customers start to take a different perspective on the product that we were sort of uh, initially selling. Mm. We had an increase of 42% in sales. Wow. So same product going to the same marketplace at the same price with the same competitive kind of threats, and we increased sales by 42%. Perspective is everything, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay, thank you. I, I, I want to move on slightly around um, the, the, the correlation between leadership and, and culture, and particularly the, particularly sort of the, the, the head of an organisation. So, you know, um, what is the, I suppose, what's, what's the way I'm trying to think of it is, if, to what degree does the head, the leader of the organisation, impact the culture? And therefore, if that leader leaves, how does that impact culture? Or is that is that just a belief? Is that a, a schema I have? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it depends on the degree to which the organisation as an entity understands what culture is. Right. So the less the organization has organizational-wide knowledge and capability in culturing, and I use that verb deliberately rather than saying culture, but the actual ability to work with, curate, grow, adapt, change, and improve your culture, then the more influential the leader will be, both positively or negatively, on the culture. Yeah. And then you can also flip that round as well and kind of go, well, what awareness does the leader actually have themselves? Um in terms of culture as well, because um, the work we do in the leadership space is, and you kind of just spoke to it actually, Claire, is, is um, we kind of work to help leaders understand how to lead a culture, not a business. Yeah. And again, most of them have never been educated or trained in that at all. So they're almost using their knowledge of leading a business or a business transformation or a business unit thinking that the same technique, language, schematics will apply to enhance the culture. And the reality is they don't. So it, it, it is a, an awareness gain and a skill set that's missing a little bit for leaders. Mm -hmm. But then the other thing I would say, and I, I, I um, apologize in advance, I've got a kind of a, a weird take on leadership anyway, a little bit. Okay. Um, uh, tell us more. Well, what, what I do is I kind of say – Leadership is only required in the absence of awareness, which sounds like a very kind of cognitive academic statement, but let me just break that down a little bit. Mm. So you only need leaders in a business if the people in the business are lacking awareness about who they are, why they're here, what they've got to do, what's happening in the marketplace, how decisions get made, how do you implement, how do you deliver, and how do you perform? So the more the culture in the organization has that awareness or can access that awareness, the less requirement there is for leadership. So yeah. when I work with my clients, I kind of like spend some time with the leadership group and just sort of share that perspective on what leadership is, is leadership fundamentally is raising the levels of awareness of all your people at all levels in all locations of your organization about what yeah. business you're in and how the business functions. And, and this is an important bit, how does it win? So, so what is required for the business to win commercially, win market share, win customer favor, win 
um, engagement from its employees, attract yeah. talent, etc. So the more the business is aware of that, the less affected it is by when a leader leaves, for example, yes. and is replaced yeah. by another, or if uh, there's a change in circumstances in the situation, like COVID or supply chains or you know economic economic turmoil in, in the marketplace or around the world as well, then the more the business has enabled a culture of awareness, the more agile, um, and I'm not talking about the process that businesses yeah, yeah, use, yeah, no. but the more agile the culture actually becomes in terms of navigating its way through change. Yeah, and, and that's what I was thinking, the, the culture of its uh, adaptability to change. And, and either an organisation that you're allowed to name that you've worked with or an organisation that you see who is doing this really well michael is there is anyone who come who who comes to mind yeah i would say uh, z energy who are um recently just been acquired by ampol who you'll be aware of in australia oh, yeah. um so they've recently just acquired z energy z energy previously the entity was shell oil in new zealand and was bought out by a super fund rebranded as z and became a very Kiwi, New Zealand orientated um, business value proposition in the marketplace and did exceptionally well because they were up against, and I won't mention uh, the competitors, but were up against global players mm. that they were competing against and in many respects outcompeted them in a number of key areas, significantly, in fact. And at the same time, we're also aware that the fossil fuel uh, situation around the world is uh, not a long-term proposition for uh, the business and even their competitors. So they very much have been um, participating and maybe even leading in some respects the conversation in New Zealand around how do we move beyond fossil fuels and then engaging even with competitors to have that conversation. Yeah. And my understanding is that Ampol were very much like-minded and saw Z, which is a significantly smaller organisation, as a real... Um, valuable proposition to acquire uh, mm. because of that. But when I spoke with the Ampol folks, I was involved in the um, culture audit for both organisations prior to the acquisition. So um, Z, even when it's acquired businesses here in New Zealand, as part of their due diligence, they've hired me to do cultural audits to see to what extent the, do the two cultures that are being brought together stand a chance of actually being effective because the number one reason mergers and acquisitions fails is because cultures can't align. Yep. So I think Ampol um, were aware of that, invited that to happen, which was just wonderful that they did that. Um, and what what was the outcome of that, uh, some of which I can't speak to, uh, obviously for commercial reasons, yes, but one of the outcomes yeah. was that there was a high degree of uh, compatibility and mutual opportunity out of the two cultures working together. So... Um, that's probably an example of one that's sort of recently been in the news that mm -hmm. maybe some of your listeners will be familiar with, where culture by both parties was considered to be a significant component of the strategic alignment of assets. Yeah. And and in your experience, Michael, do you, do you see now with, with mergers and acquisitions greater attention being paid to the alignment of, of the two cultures? Or is it still missed off sometimes or not paid sufficient attention to? No, it's, it's still mostly completely ignored. Um, and, and to be honest, uh, you, can see when it, you can see when it's been used because the mergers and acquisitions either don't go ahead because it's been identified it's folly mm. or they go ahead and gain enormous traction and progress in their sector or in their industries because they're able to take advantage of the asset that they've now kind of unleashed or leveraged for themselves. So even externally, it's usually quite obvious which ones have done their homework and which ones haven't. Yeah. yeah. And that, that reminds me, actually, it's no, nowhere on the level that you did, but um, the this internet company that I worked for, uh, that was one of my jobs was I partnered with the finance director and we did some cultural due diligence on potential oh, acquisitions. Wow. I well forgot. Done. I forgot all about. And actually, one of well them, uh, one of them in one of the Germanic countries, on paper looked fabulous, mm. but but they didn't know that I spoke German. 
So I was just sitting, listening, listening to how they were talking about us, listening to, and and, and just, I, I came back and I said, this is not going to work. This is, mm. you know, this is, it's going to be a lot of hard work and it won't work. And, and, and lot, lots of other different reasons. Um, but yes, it was, it was quite a, quite a forward looking organization, but on a tiny, on a tiny scale compared to, uh, to what you're doing. And you mentioned before about, you know, you, about COVID and adapting to change and what have you. And of course now we're in this situation um, where organizations are sort of grappling with the whole idea of hybrid and and on a continuum that some are perceiving it as a as a logistics exercise and others are realizing that you know gosh how do we make the commute worth it and and, and all the other things that are, are coming into to play around hybrid um and and quite often I hear the conversation or get asked well how do we maintain our culture if our people are not in the office, and I, I, and I wanted to know what's your opinion of that, and it's probably not going to be standard given the, the conversation <laughs> we've just had. I'm yes. really curious. Right. Um, look, to be honest, when you hear an organisation say how we're going to maintain our culture given that we've just moved into hybrid, it probably again means that they haven't done enough foundational work in culture in the first place. Mm. Because I don't have a single client. I'm just chicken macker. I'm just going to think. Yeah, I can't think of a single client I've got that has ever uttered even anything remotely like that. Um, because if you've done the groundwork already in culture, that is clear what yeah. you would do with culture to do. So I think when you hear organizations saying that, for me, that's just probably an indication that they're one of those kind of 92% that haven't necessarily been invested enough in terms of truly understanding and, and dare I say it, mastering culturing as an asset for the business and therefore when something like this turns up it kind of catches them out a little bit mm. so it's unfortunate and uh, but as, as you've noted it's incredibly common where organizations are struggling with this a little bit and the other thing as well is that uh, that sort of speaks to the again they're getting confused between organization and culture and they're, yeah. they're, they're absolutely two different things so you can have remote remote cultures that are just as passionately involved and committed and delivering as if it was in a central place, if you understand how culture is structured and how to use that structure to accommodate um, displacement. And a, a, a really sort of simple example of that, if you look at, say, Irish culture as, as represented in pubs around the world, <laughs> right, it's... The, the space and the place and the distance needn't be a problem if the actual foundational narrative, symbols, belief systems are understood, celebrated and embraced by people, then you don't have a difficulty with it being elsewhere. So you end up with situations where um, I regularly, I'm a, I'm a Liverpool football club um, fan, have been ever since I was a young boy. And it's fascinating. Um, I've just been invited to do a little bit of work with the English Premier League, and one of the people I'm speaking to there was ex, ex involved with Liverpool, and they were saying that they've got Liverpool's got more fans in South East Asia than they do in Liverpool. Yeah, and that from an engagement uh, point of view, investment point of view, in terms of when talking about commercial spend, um, they are ahead of people in Liverpool. And in terms of a cultural historical connection, they are on par with Liverpool fans. So they can refer back to, you know, players and uh, specific games in Liverpool's history that were crucial or key cornerstones of the Liverpool narrative and story. And yet they're in Thailand or, or Malaysia or Philippines. Yeah. So this, they're as invested in the narrative, they're as invested in the belief system, the identity, which is actually quite remarkable if you think about the number of other English football clubs or even just football clubs elsewhere in the world that they could have attached to. And you kind of go, well, why Liverpool? It's because the narrative, again, the understanding of what culture is and how to connect with it has been clearly used effectively to enable people to engage with, connect with and embody Absolutely. And uh, again, coming back to leadership, um, to what extent do you think that that commitment would rise or fall were Jurgen Klopp to leave? 
again, uh, uh, Jurgen Klopp's done wonders. So for those of listeners who don't know who Jurgen Klopp is, he's the current manager of Liverpool who has instigated a significant turnaround in uh, the, the way the club has performed and uh, how it operates and even how it recruits has been extremely influential. Um, the answer to that question is, you know, could it maintain if he left? And the the answer to that is to the degree to which, again, mm. the awareness has been embodied within the club that the key principles and beliefs that Jürgen has brought in are actually what are making the progress. And I'm, I'm, I'm saying progress at the moment, but they're doing particularly, know, po- they're doing particularly poorly this season. But, yeah, if, again, it's if it's just held in Jürgen Klopp's head, then we've got a problem, right? So the more that individual, that leader, is able to narrate, tell the yes. story and explanation of the belief systems they have, the um, methodologies they use, the principles behind those methodologies and why we're doing it that way, yeah. the overarching strategy and game that they're actually playing. So um, even the business side, you've got to look at it quite strategically and actually ask the question, what what game is Liverpool actually playing? Yeah. And you might, the obvious answer might be, well, you know, that's silly, it's football. And you're going, well, is it or is it entertainment? Or is it recruitment? Are they actually in the, the recruitment business? What business are we in? Yeah, that's it. So until you can answer that question about what business you're actually in rather than the one you think you're in, you don't actually know what culture is required to be aligned to achieve that. Ooh, so that, that, that's a massive light bulb moment for me. It, it's absolutely critical. Yeah, well, can I share a story? Um, maybe they'll just bring that alive, Claire. But um, so I can't mention the company name, but I can talk about the industry and, and the journey they went on. Um, they originally, uh, sorry, they're a real estate company, and they brought me in just to kind of look at how can we kind of create a warm, friendly culture that makes it a nice place to work. So I went and had a look at what they were doing. But one of the first things I always ask clients is, what business are you in? And they said, well, <laughs> the real estate. So I said, oh, great, thank you. And so then we started to um, engage with each other. But the, the longer I stayed engaged with them, the more I couldn't see or understand why they were saying they were in real estate. There was nothing about their operating model that indicated that that was actually true. Mm-hmm. And eventually I had to sort of sit down with the senior leadership team and go, look, I, I need your help here because everybody in your business has told me that you're a real estate company. And Everything I'm looking at and everything I've heard and everything I've sort of explored here is telling me that's not where your revenue is coming from. And the CFO just looked at me and went, you're right. I went, well, can you explain to me where the revenue is coming from? And he said, yeah, from our agents, commissions. So I said, well, that's interesting, isn't it? So I said, your actual revenue is coming from your own agents' commissions. So you're not selling and buying houses. Your agents are. Yeah. They are self-employed but operating under your brand and paying you a license fee to do so. They go and make the sale and you process that sale, get a, a clip of the ticket or a commission from it, and so do they. And so long story short, out of that meeting, I basically kind of said, well, it sounds to me like you're a recruitment business, not a real estate business. And the light bulbs kind of all went around the room and everyone, oh. and so he sort of said, well, in that case, you, your strategy and your investment should be on, you should be investing heavily in finding who is out there in society that you believe would make extremely successful real estate agents. You need to go and yeah. invest, research that and then spend your time and money recruiting and training them because they are going to be effective at buying and selling houses, which is where you're making your money from, which changes the branch culture of each of your real estate branches, then they got branches all, all around the country. And so once they realized that, we kind of had to get together all the uh, franchise owners and the business unit owners and explain to them what business we're actually in. And therefore, we needed a completely different culture to optimize the performance of people in those environments. Uh, oh, gosh, yes. Uh, and if, if there was one thing I... I would say that that is so powerful and and, and I did it not so long ago with an executive committee was to ask that question what business are we in and I got four different answers 
Mm. And then the CEO came up with an answer that was quite alien to the rest of the group. Um, and so we just stopped everything that we were doing and had the conversation around those different perspectives. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. And I, I hear you, Claire. I, I get the same thing. You often get multiple versions of what business you're in from the leadership team, which is a you know a real worry because if they don't know what business they're in, then no, none of the employees are going to know, and, and potentially none of the customers either, which is or investors or suppliers. So it's a, it is a crucial thing to get absolute one hundred percent clarity mm. on. And then the other thing I notice is that when executive teams have those conversations, that they often almost over philosophize what business they're in. So they come up with uh, deep and meaningful contributions to the world and society, which is um, wonderful and lovely to see that they're thinking about kind of purpose-led organizations. But at the same time, I often find that they, not all of them, of course, but it's it's quite re- it's a good portion of leaders that forget to look at the really pragmatic side of you're actually yeah. in a business and you've got shareholders and stakeholders and employees that are kind of relying on you being successful or at least surviving and therefore you do need to have a kind of a pragmatic side of the conversation as well about what what business are we actually in where do we actually generate revenue from and are we aligned to optimizing that and i don't mean profiteering i don't mean just um never-ending growth of profit but actually just making sure that you're running your business and the culture yeah. that's operating within the business in a way that streamlines for you to give the best possible service and uh, products to the marketplace in return for that revenue that you're generating. Yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, gosh, I thought we'd only be going for about half an hour. <laughs> We're 50 minutes. It's, wow, where did that time go? Um, oh, and I, I've got, had, I'm going to have to do a part two. I've got so many, I've got so many, more, <laughs> so many more questions for you, Michael. Um Wow. Okay. So um, I don't know how you distill this. And there's, there's something else that I want to talk about, about something that you're making available in the new year. But in terms of if, if we were to distill it down to to one key message to, to you know, I, I'm sure there's the, all these light bulbs going on for people listening to this today as well. And oh, gosh, you know, what? where do I start? Um, what if, if, I, if, if there were one thing that I as a leader could focus on that could help me start to understand at a deeper level what this culture thing is, what would it be? Well, I love the way you just language that question because you said understand at a deeper level. And in actual fact, that is the starting place. If you do not understand culture at a deeper level or even understand there is a deeper level to culture to understand, then automatically you're already going to under-deliver on it. So if I were to summarise the key thing uh, leaders and organizations absolutely, almost vitally need to get clear on is that your business cannot outperform its culture. Yeah. And once you understand that, and I haven't got time to go into the research mm-hmm. on it, but it's unequivocal in terms of the data and we've got on that now is that no business can outperform its culture. Once you understand that, then that, that awareness alone starts to change the questions you ask of yourself, starts to uh, change the degree to which you make culture a priority or the degree mm-hmm. to which you sponsor and support your people in the business that are overseeing or responsible for kind of working and developing your culture. And and even that's staggering. I've just spoken at a keynote earlier today at a conference of people in culture and HR experts, and the MC just asked the audience, um, so it was probably about 700 professionals in the room. Mm-hmm. Uh, the MC just asked um, how many of them felt that the senior leadership team understand the importance of culture and are basically supporting and sponsoring these leaders to work with culture effectively and please raise their hand and of the 700 there was about six people put their hand up well michael henderson i think you're going to be very very busy (laughs) (laughs) yeah um, that's not good that's uh, i get commercially that sounds uh, great but it's a real shame that we're this this day and age where uh, yeah, we've got so many businesses that really haven't kind of understood what this thing culture is and the role it's playing in their business 
uh, both now, but also more importantly for the future? Well, from a strengths-based perspective, there's a phenomenal room for exploration and and, uh, and improvement and, and enlightenment and actually linking with that. Um, there's... Uh, can you tell us a little bit about your your and I love the fact that you that you verbalize culture your culturing high performance programs that you I believe are making available in the new year oh thank you Claire that's that's very kind of you to invite that question um, yeah traditionally what we've done is we've partnered with clients um, kind of over the last 30 35 years around the world to support them um, to work with them to develop their culture and with the COVID situation and people working from home, we've sort of repackaged that whole uh, program. Uh, we're in the process of repackaging. We'll be launching mm-hmm. it in the new year where individuals from organisations for the first time will be able to um, access that program. So it means that um, people within the organisation and HR or uh, people in culture, professionals, is, will be able to engage and learn about everything we've just been talking about and so much more to be able to sort of gather that awareness and understanding on behalf of their organisation to then think about how they can go about guiding the organisation to become more and more in tune and more and more aware and more and more masterful at this whole process of culturing. So, uh, yeah, just a big shift from kind of the um, mass programme to a large organisation yeah. and, and actually opening it up for almost any size organisation with individuals that see the benefit in learning how to align culture as a strategic asset. Well, I know once... Um, certainly, the, coming full circle now, um, when you when you did that keynote, uh, that everybody was, and I, I, I'm not being sycophantic, I wasn't exaggerating, that everybody was writing furiously because it was just these light bulbs of understanding, the beginning of that understanding of, of what this means and, and, and the potential that it has. And I've got all sorts of things going on in my head at the moment. You know, you're talking about people who have a, a title of, of people, head of director of people and culture and that, you know, by really focusing on both um, equally, the, the, the difference that that can make. So uh, if the if information isn't available now for those programs, as soon as they become available, I'll add it to the show notes. If the information is available, please let me know and I'll pop it on because it, you know, there's only there's only so many places Michael Henderson can travel to, but if we can access <laughs> Michael Henderson in a way um, as individuals, then then think about the ripple effect of that. Oh, Michael, oh. it's been such a pleasure. Oh, thank you, Claire. I mean, uh, yeah, thoroughly enjoyed the conversation. Um, particularly enjoyed your uh, your questions. I mean, wonderful. Thank you. Great. Well, I'll put all the details of people how can uh, how people can connect with you on the show notes. Um, Go well. Thank you. And um, yes, uh, I'll book you in for part two. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you, Claire. (laughs) Thanks so much. Goodbye, Michael. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening. And we hope that this conversation provided the insights and inspiration that you were looking for. Did you know that Authentic Leadership is currently ranking sixth in the top 25 Australian leadership podcasts? You can help us get to number one by heading over to Apple iTunes and doing three quick things. One, subscribing. Two, giving us a positive rating. And three, writing a short review. This is the most effective way for us to get the key messages around 21st century leadership out into the community. And before you go, if you're in the business of learning and development or HR and are looking for a facilitator or speaker, let's talk. You can head over to the BrainSmart website, that's brain-smart.com, to see examples of our programs, or email me, Claire, that's C-L-A-R-E, at brain-smart.com. Go well, and thanks for listening.